So last time when we introduced the multi-level Monte Carlo, uh, we said that essentially this was a technique to produce control variates that were effective in the presence of uh, differential equations that were uh, discretized in, with respect to uh, different uh, approximation levels. And essentially what we were doing were, was essentially to pass samples from refined costly um, levels into less costly, less refined levels. And, and uh, for isotropic uh, problems, essentially, this is uh, this this picture that I'm showing here in in terms of levels is a, is the right thing to to do, right, in numerical analysis. So essentially, you, as I said, you try with a certain mesh first, and if it is not satisfying your bias constraint, you will refine and try, you know, with an isotropic refined mesh to try to 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 meet that uh, constraint. And then once you meet that, you will use this to reduce the variance on that one. Now. Once you get to that point, um, you can think about the following. I mean, essentially, to reduce the, the variance, to do a control variant on this guy, what you essentially need is another computational discretization that is somehow close to this in L2, right? So the variance of the difference between the computation out of this and the other should be small, and the computational cost to compute in the other one should be smaller. This, this of course, satisfies that constraint but it's not the only way we can do, even if the problem is isotropic. So these other two, for instance, where you de-refine essentially along only one direction, also satisfy the same constraint, right? They are cheaper to compute than this guy. And if this was close to this, of course, you expect this to be, to be close to this one as well, OK? So the question is, now that you know that you have more candidates to use as control variates, how to use them? That's the motivation for multi-index Monte Carlo. And uh, before we jump into that, let me introduce a little bit of notation. So um, this is essentially um, an isotropic refinement. So you can think now that we go to this uh, linear PDE that we had at the beginning, right, in three dimensions. And we have delta x, delta y, delta z. And uh, when we did multi level Monte Carlo, the presentation of multi level Monte Carlo, we were refining delta x, delta y, and delta z simultaneously, right? Refining them, linking them with a parameter h. And whenever we refine one direction, we refine the other, OK? And we essentially said that all of them were um, linked, essentially, through these constraints. So we said that, uh, essentially, delta x, l was delta y, l was delta z, l. And essentially, this was hco divided by 2 to the l, just to fix ideas. Right? So there was a single level here acting on all of them. Now we are going to, to flexibilize a little bit the, the, the approach. And we'll say that they are not going to be linked. So essentially, delta x will be a certain delta x0 divided by 2 to the alpha 1, say, and so forth for the other, so forth with the other, the other direction. So this will be, there will be a vector, say, here in 3D, right? alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, that will tell you how refined are the different directions. And uh, given the numerical method and this parameter of discretization, the numerical approximation will be uniquely defined. OK? So that's essentially what is here. Right? We have different edges along different directions. Uh, the refinement along these directions is different. And it's uniquely defined by this alpha multi-index. right? And before, remember, we were trying to approximate g. Now we will approximate g by g alpha. This is a real valued random variable, as we discussed yesterday. And we are trying to compute the expected value of g. And that will be approximated by a sample average of some kind out of g alphas. All right? So before we proceed, also, we need to, to introduce the unidirectional differences. And these are denoted here by delta i, meaning that if, if essentially you cannot refine farther along this direction, you just take g alpha, that is if alpha i is 0. But if you can uh, de refine along that direction, essentially this is g alpha minus g alpha de refined only along direction i. Is that clear? So essentially, that's essentially the, the, the same picture that I had before, right? I mean, I have 
this and uh, if you do refine along one direction say only you may get this right okay so that's essentially the picture there so you're taking differences between two approximate solutions one that is slightly more refined than the other along direction i that's essentially the message and now that you have these uh, unidirectional differences defined you compose them so this is now a mixed first order difference and we denote that this uh, the, that operator as delta okay don't confuse this delta with the delta of multi monte carlo this is acting on d directions at the same time and I must emphasize, these d directions are the d directions you have in, in, a, in the discretization parameters. In this example of three-dimensional PDE, okay, this may be the three dimensions, but in general, they could be anything, right? Um, okay, so you can rewrite this in another, another way as well. Just to, to mention that this, this operator will just evaluate different approximations out, out of the, the G alphas, right? Okay, so... Um, Again, the notation here may, may be, make you believe that you need a tensor, a tensor type of a domain to work, but this is not true, actually. You can generalize this in, in different ways, but I'm not going to stop uh, on this part. I will continue describing things, and we can discuss later uh, details. So how does it look, say, in 2D, uh, this operator? Well, you take a difference of a difference, and uh, if you see at the end of the day what is going to happen, well, you get a plus one, in the deepest level, right? And then alternating minus ones and plus one until you get to, to the coarsest level. So the stencil in the alpha one, alpha two plane contains these, th these four points in, uh, in 2D, right? And if you are in 3D, it will contain eight points. So, so this may look scary from the computational point of view, but you have to realize that actually this, this point here is the one that dominates the, the cost on everything, right? This is the most refined edge. And, uh, the work is going to, to grow um, algebraically with respect to the different parameters, so this is fine. Okay, uh, now how do you build the estimator? Um, well, you begin first by assuming that there's consistency, right? That when these alphas are sufficiently refined, essentially, or that the minimum of them essentially goes to infinity, then you converge to the right quantity. That's any numerical method has to satisfy that, otherwise you don't use it. Um, and then, based on that, you can just represent the true value by a sum over all multi-indices now in this lattice that has d dimensions. Okay? Now that you, you do that, you're going to truncate this out, out of the, uh, into the d into uh, this i calligraph set, which is again a set in, in uh, multi-indices. And, well, then you're going to apply Monte Carlo to each of these expectations. That's essentially what it does. So when you do that, the, the resulting estimator looks very close to the, in notation-wise at least, in notation-wise, uh, it looks very close to the multi-level, but now you're summing over multi-indices, right? And these differences are no longer first-order differences, they are first-order mixed differences, okay? So that's different. And, and of course, for each alpha now, you have to come up with the correct number of samples, which is M alpha. So you have to define now these M alphas for each of the alphas belonging to I. So you're going to try to control the bias and the statistical error coming out of these estimators so that uh, we achieve the prescribed tolerance by the user with the correct confidence level, right? Like in any computational method that you do with Monte Carlo, somebody gives you the tolerance you want to achieve and the confidence level, and that's what you want to fit. Okay, so once you do that, essentially this is the goal. Somebody gave to you the tolerance they want in the, in, in the, in the computation and the confidence level, and you are going to, to do something that they are going not, not going to see. Essentially, you're going to split this into a bias constraint and statistical constraint through that through a properly chose theta, chosen theta, and uh, of course, you're going to approximate this probability constraint into a variance constraint. All right, so um, this looks, again, very much like we discussed with multi-level, so don't need to stop too much. Um, the formula, as I discussed yesterday, looks again for the M's, very much like, uh, like in multi-level, but now the V's are the variances of these mixed differences, right? And the work is the work to compute these mixed differences. So uh, this, again, indicates that after you substitute these M's, you will have a, a sort of lower bound on the complexity that is told to the minus two, precisely like in multi level Monte Carlo. And now you have this sum, and again, this sum can either diverge or 
converge as I calligraph covers the whole set n to the d, right? The, the whole set of indices. Because of, of course, this I calligraph is a, is, a, is a set that controls the bias, right? So if there's consistency again, and the problem is not trivial, as tolerance goes to zero, the I calligraph has to cover all, this, all the set n to the d, correct? So this, this set of indices is going to diverge, so you have to check whether this sum converges or not, right? And that's what I said, the minimal cost essentially, that is just a cost of, the cost of one sample per, per index. And we make the usual assumption that this is the dominant cost, and uh, we analyze things in terms of this, all right? So once you substitute the optimal number of samples, essentially the work of the multi-index Monte Carlo is completely defined in terms of this set i, okay? So before in multi-level, we only have to define one number that was L capital, that was an integer, but now we have to de define a set in the, in the you know, lattice n to the d, which is much, much, more, it's much more complex, right? Uh, so we need, we need some guidance to do that. So let's, let's see. Um, for example, you can just try with a, with a full tensor type of a set, right? That would be this kind of thing where you do an isotropically uh, a choice that goes in different directions with a limit Li. Uh, and of course, if you see the bias, essentially, the, the bias is going to, to, to just go along the, the representation that we had before. Essentially, it's the sum over the complement of this set IL, right? So remember, we, were, we started with uh, this representation, right? That the expectation is, is this whole sum, and we approximate this by this. The difference, of course, is the sum over the complement. And that's what guides uh, the, the control on the bias. So, uh, if, you take, um, <coughs> if you take a triangular inequality, essentially you sum over the absolute values of the contributions of, of the expected values of, the, of these deltas. And the, the question of finding the optimal I calligraph, essentially, is to minimize the work corresponding to a given set I calligraph sub subject to the constraint that the bias is less than this, right? Because the, 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 the M's were already chosen to, to satisfy the the optimally the, the statistical constraint. So uh, if, if this is the case, essentially to, to, uh, to optimize uh, the work is the same as more optimizing the, the square root of the work. And uh, essentially what you, what you see, right, after you take a square root here is that this part does not depend on, on, the, on the set. This is the only part that depends on the set, right? And you take the square root here. So you're optimizing this subject to uh, this, this constraint. And this is essentially a knapsack problem that can be solved by thresholding the corresponding profits. And the profits here are defined by the bias contribution divided by the work contribution. And this essentially is defined in terms of this uh, expected value contribution, variance contribution, and the work contribution. So all the, the relevant parameters come into the construction. Uh, OK, so let's see. Um, you can connect this with the theory of sparse grids, of course, and the combination technique. Um, but the, more, the, the interesting thing is, again, that, that uh, the thresholding that I, I told you is essentially the optimal way of choosing these, these i's, right? So the only thing you have to do is to define these profits and find the ISO lines, somehow, of these profits in this n to the d uh, set. And if you do that, then you have the proper shape for this family of of uh, sets in uh, alpha one, alpha two, or in general, uh, n to the d, right? So you, they may look like this, right? For different thresholds that, that you put, right? You have uh, the different uh, members of the family of this i, i calif uh, nu, okay? So essentially, once you know the shape of these sets, the only thing that you have to do in order to achieve a bias, less than tolerance, say, is to find what is a what is a member of, of this family, which is a member of this family, such that the sum over the complement of it, of the bias contributions, is actually uh, almost tolerance, essentially, slightly less than tolerance. So you try to find the minimal set of, of this family that satisfies the bias constraint, okay? That's the way you do it. So, but it, it's important first to know which is the family that you're working with, because once you know that, there's only a single parameter that is left, and you, you fix that to find the bias constraint, to satisfy the bias constraint. So that's essentially what we do here, okay? So we 
we find that member of the family that satisfies this. And uh, once you do that, essentially you have this, this guy here, right? And uh, I, as I told you with multi-level, this sum can, can either diverge or converge, right? So you will have a tolerance to the minus two that is coming out of Monte Carlo from here. And this P can be larger than zero or, or, a, or a equal to zero, depending on the, on the different uh, combinations of the growth of W alpha and the decrease of V alpha, correct? Um, there could be log terms here, also multiplying. So again, if you, if you want to, um, to show a little bit uh, how this works, you need to exemplify with uh, some assumptions. And the assumptions that we have here are particular. They are not, they are not for the general multi-index Monte Carlo theory. Again, the general multi-index Monte Carlo theory goes along defining these, these profits and just holding them. So many problems will have different type of things and will give you different type of sets. But I'm going to exemplify now with something that you can, so you can compare with the multi-level theory that we saw before. Okay, so this is an example. It's not a general theory. All right, so in this example, we assume that the bias, the variance, and the work, they all have multiplicative behavior with respect to the discretization parameters. Why would you expect, in some cases, to have this, uh, this behavior? Well, remember, the deltas are mixed differences. So you're taking a difference of a difference of a difference. If you remember the, the, the discretization of a mixed derivative of a smooth function, right? That's precisely that structure. You have a function, you take a finite difference along the first direction, and then you take a, all that result, a finite difference of the other direction, and then so forth. And at the end, what do you have? That thing is bounded by the mixed, the, the, the mixed derivative times the product of the deltas in the delta x's in the different directions. This is essentially the same, right? I mean, intuitively, proofs aside, right? This is intuition that guides you to expect a product here if you have the right regularity in, in your parameters, of course. Okay, uh, with respect to the work, this is the same thing as we had before, right? So if you have these assumptions, you can go and, and uh, substitute the work and, uh, and uh, Essentially, what do you find? Well, after you threshold the profits, you realize that in this particular set of assumptions, the, the optimal sets are just uh, thresholded by hyperplanes, okay? So they look like this. Where the tilting of these hyperplanes here are precisely defined in terms of the coefficients that we have for the weak convergence, the strong convergence, and the growth of the work along each of the directions, okay? So all the assumptions that we make with respect to the, the difference convergence and divergence uh, parameters enter in the definition of the optimal set. This is, also, again, a reassuring, a reassuring uh, uh, fact, okay? And this is how the, the sets look like. And of course, they are now defined in terms of a single parameter that we call L. This is not the same L as in multi-level. Again, it's just notation. And the only thing that you have to find is L of tall in order to satisfy the bias constraint. This L still will, will uh, be of the order of log tall as the other one, but it's not the same again. So this is how these sets look like. Uh, well, we have some result that is a little bit difficult to read, but I'm going to, to exemplify with one case, which again, this is the SE case, so let's go to the PD, uh, PD case. This is what we call the smooth noise uh, case, and where we actually compare the Monte Carlo, the multi-level, and the multi-index. So what do we have here? Essentially, you can think that this is motivated by, by the same PDE that we had before. So essentially, it's a sort of divergence, A gradient U, right, equals F, minus here, and then plus one the conditions. So that these, these coefficients here are smoothly varying with respect to the, the noise, right? So then this U is also smooth, and uh, essentially the, the, weak, the weak rate and the strong rate relate to each other by one being double the other, essentially. So there's nothing, nothing Ito type of, uh, of effect here. Now, uh, what do we also assume in this case? That we have an isotropic problem. So essentially, there's no preferred direction. And if you would have to, to solve the deterministic problem here, you would solve it using delta x equals delta y equals delta z. So in principle, there's no advantage to use an isotropy of, of this kind that I'm using here. But still there is, OK? So 
all the betas are the same, all the gammas are the same, all the w's are the same, and d uh, is, uh, say, larger or equal than 3. Okay, then the work, remember from Monte Carlo, was the number of samples, right, times the, the work that you get to, to control the bias below, below tolerance, so it has this, this growth. If you do multi Monte Carlo, you have these three, three cases, right, that where you have to essentially control the S versus the, the gamma, and S is 2W, so we substitute it directly here. And, and again, uh, what happens here with multi-index Monte Carlo is, a, is, is something interesting. If you satisfy the, the, the assumptions, then this constraint gets rid of the D, okay? So it, it is enough for 2W to be larger than, w, than uh, gamma to be actually be in the optimal case. So many more problems actually will fall into the optimal case. And if we now look how, uh, how even the, the, the worst case looks like, if you want to call it worst, up to log terms, right? Here, essentially, we have told to the minus d gamma divided by w, which is essentially the cost that you need to run one realization that meets the bias constraint. So from the complexity point of view, uh, multi-level Monte Carlo in this problem brings uh, the, the complexity of a stochastic problem in D dimensions, right, to the complexity of a deterministic problem in D dimensions, right? Now, if you, if you use a, up to the log terms, if you use a multi-index, this will bring you to a deterministic problem in one dimension, okay? So you begin from a stochastic problem in D dimensions, you get the complexity up to log terms of a deterministic problem in 1D, okay? And you didn't change the finite element space, essentially you, you just uh, sample in different, uh, in different ways. Okay, so um, that's essentially what I wanted to say. So essentially, the, if, if, you, if you satisfy the, the assumptions, the multi-index uh, Monte Carlo is bringing you back to a one-dimensional in the discretization space, essentially. This is what is going on. Um, okay, so how does it work? I mean, that, does it... Uh, does it really show in practice? Um, or maybe the constants, the multiplicative constants in front of things are, are really bad. So let's take, again, um, this is smooth case with a PDE. This is a three-dimensional computation. Um, okay, of the same kind. So first, we make sure that if you're going to compare methods, they do satisfy the error versus uh, tolerance uh, type of constraint, right? And then we see also what is the memory required for the, la uh, the largest problem in the sample to solve. Remember, I mean, we, are, we, were, we will be sampling many different things, right? And out of them, one will be the largest problem that we have to, to solve in terms of memory, okay? So if you do multi-level Monte Carlo uh, in this problem, this is how the memory required growth in terms of the tolerance that you're prescribing. It does grow like that if you choose multi Monte Carlo or if you choose the non-optimal set for multi-index Monte Carlo, which is full tensor, okay? But if you actually use the, the corresponding optimal in this case, which is a, a, a TD, right, where you, you sum the indices and you, th you make them less, less than, than a given value, then the growth of the memory requirement is much, much smaller. You see here already that at 10 to the minus 2, in the, in the, which is a very engineering type of, of scale, uh, this is uh, essentially, what, 10 to the 3 almost versus uh, 10 to the 6, okay? So this is a big, big difference in terms of memory. And if you actually go and look at the complexity, the constants, the multiplicative constants look almost the same, but in this problem already, you have the, the optimal complexity for multi-index Monte Carlo, 10 to the minus 2, and if you do the wrong choice of the, of the optimal set in multi-index Monte Carlo, you, you get total to the minus three, which is the same as you will get with multi-level Monte Carlo in this problem, okay? So it really pays to be careful when you choose the, the discretization space for multi-index Monte Carlo. Otherwise, you don't get the, the correct complexity, even if you satisfy the, the assumptions, okay? So... How do you explain the difference of exponents, perhaps? I'm confused here. This? Is minus five and minus three. So? Oh, the, it is precisely coming from here. The minus five is coming from here, okay. the, the, the other guy is coming here, and the other falls here. It's just because the D, since it is okay, three, okay. is pushing you to the other, the other set, okay? So it's a precise application of this, of this thing. So what I'm trying to, to tell you here is that the theory is followed, but also the constants are essentially comparable. So, so 
uh, the exponents really tell you what is going on. Okay? And again, if you say, okay, I'm clever, I'm just going to sample my finite element code, you get a, a, a something that is tall to the minus five, right? That I'm not, I'm not even showing here. All right? So it's a super bad idea. Now, if you go to four dimensions, then Monte Carlo, it's a total dog, right? It's a tall to the minus six. And, and then if you, if you use multi-level, you get a, comp, uh, a tall to the minus four, and you still get tall to the minus two in multi-index Monte Carlo. And, and this is where the memory runs out, essentially, for multi-level Monte Carlo, while the other can still keep going, right? It's a big difference in terms of, of memory as well. So you can solve larger problems with the same, the same thing. Okay, so you can test also the QQ plot that the normality is well satisfied and things like that. So um, just wrapping up, multi Monte Carlo is a generalization of multi-level that performs better usually if you satisfy the regularity, uh, mix of regularity properties. So you should use it in, if you have that, that available. Uh, I told you that it was a general framework and, and the way to think about it is through the profits. Uh, and the multi-index Monte Carlo does not need to be a special dimension. I'm going to show you now uh, something on that direction. And uh, let's see. Well, we can also have connections with, uh, with inverse problems, as we're going to, to see later. So before I, I jump into, into this, let me, um, let me give you a couple of things. Okay, so some of you already saw this when you enter the room today, right? This is a system of stochastic particles. It's modeling pedestrians trying to exit from a given place, right? So this is a velocity plane and a position plane, essentially. It's a kinetic formulation based on a system of Ito stochastic differential equations. Uh, okay, and uh, actually from the distance, right, people may look like that, right? I mean, this is a pilgrimage in, in the Kava and uh, you see, these are people, and uh, they very much look from a distance like the motion of a fluid, right? So one is trying to model these kind of things. Um, so just to focus a little bit more, let me go to the, uh, the equations. Okay. So I'll walk you through this example of uh, an application of multi-index Monte Carlo. This is a work with a, one of my former PhD students that is currently in Oxford. Okay, so this is stochastic particle systems, as I, as I told you, that you want to, um, to compute some expected value at final time again in the same context of the computations that we did before. Um, so what is complicated here essentially is that, that in the evolution of the state, which is x, right, this x will now contain all the positions and all the, the velocities, say, in that example that we described before, the interaction of a single position and a single velocity, say, is towards the rest of the particles in the, in the system. So essentially, it is affected by the law of, of, uh, of this, uh, these particles. And, and this couples the whole system in a, in a complicated way. Uh, but the good news is that under certain assumptions, as the number of particles increase in the system, you essentially have a certain sort of limit, and the, the marginal distribution of each of these particles be, uh, becomes a, a single de well-defined value. Okay, but you can the, you can use this to, to bring yourself into into a computation with partial de integral differential equations that are no no local, or you can just do a simulation based on Monte Carlo and the stochastic particle systems. We're going to do the Monte Carlo one. Okay, now. Your goal, again, is to compute this expected value out of, uh, say, a computation an observable out of possibly the marginal uh, of, of the system, but we just put the whole system here still. Um, so let's, let's take an example. This, is a, this again, is, a, is an Ito stochastic differential equation, right? Uh, we are now just write, writing uh, things in terms of x. And uh, you have p such uh, <coughs> equations, p particles. Right? So P here capital is denoted as the, as the number of particles in the system, and it's one of the discretization uh, parameters, if you wish, whereas delta T, the, the way we are going to discretize it, Ito uh, <coughs> differential equation will be the other. Okay? So in this case, then, the two parameters for multi-index to, to play with will be delta T and P. Okay? So you can do, you can do um, well, of course, this is the integral differential <coughs> equation that I, I told you before, so there's nothing to stop here for. Uh, this is a, an example, the Kuramoto's oscillator model, that uh, this is what I'm going to, to be doing the computations with. 
And uh, the interaction here through uh, the different particles is through this sinus function, which is nicely behaved. But you see that each of the particles interacts with all the rest, right? So this is what makes the coupling, essentially. And you want to compute some, some, computation, some quantity that is uh, essentially the total order or disorder at final time. We are not working with infinite time. We just work with finite time. That time is T capital. Um, OK, so let's see. Um, this is a discretization, right, based on Euler. So you see that there's a time step here that we denote that uh, as T capital divided by N. And the other parameter, again, is the number of particles P in the system. So the game, again, is to satisfy the constraints on accuracy, right, with minimal work. Um, and if you, if you just do Monte Carlo, you get a complexity that is told to the minus 4. Uh, this is because the variance, actually, in the estimator is not O1, as in the examples that we discussed before. Essentially, it's O of the inverse of one of the, um, I mean, the number of, uh, number of particles in the system. This is just because of uh, some, some interesting effect that is called propagation of chaos. I mean, things become almost independent as, uh, as the number of particles increase in the system. So uh, once you, you figure this out and you do the complexity, you get this optimal Mont Monte Carlo computation costing essentially told to the minus four. And this is not related really with the dimension, right? This is just what you get out of, the, uh, out of this, this behavior in terms of bias and, and variance. So it's, it's very robust. Now, how far can we push this if we, if we use multi-index Monte Carlo, properly done? Uh, well, this is a long story, but uh, essentially, what you, what you do here um, is, to, um, is to discretize simultaneously, again, with respect to delta t and, uh, and p. So now you will have um, two indices, right? One related to delta t, one related to p, right? And you will verify the assumptions. And the assumptions essentially will bring you to this optimal set that is the, the hyperplane. Uh, OK, so let's see. Um, See, I already told you that. Okay, so okay, so what do we do in this in this quickly just to, to 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 understand the comparison? You have two parameters, right? So if you're going to do multi uh, multi level Monte Carlo, you have the choice to either fix the number of particles so the bias with respect to the number of particles is satisfied and do multi level in time. You can also fix the delta t so delta t satisfies the 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 bias constraint and do multi-level with respect to the number of particles, whatever that means, right? Or you can try to be clever and link a refinement in delta t and, and p simultaneously and do multi-level in that, in that way, right? Or do multi-index, right? So what, what does it get you, essentially? So you verify the, the assumptions and things like that, so I'm not going to stop too much on that. Let's see, let me, let me go directly to the to the result, and then we we can discuss things later. So, okay, multi-index. This again, I told you that that uh, in this case the the set is still uh, defined by a hyperplane, right? So, um, and you verify actually that that uh, the convergence rates for the the mixed differences are actually satisfying this this mixed regularity assumption. Um, so you, you bring the computation from tall to the minus 4 with Monte Carlo to, to tall to the minus 2 up to log, log uh, tall terms. <coughs> okay? So essentially, same discretization. This is Euler. Okay? Euler did not change. It is there all the time. Uh, the only thing we do is we sample differently. So two things to remember, essentially, the, 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 the coupling between P and, and delta T is really useful. The coupling in, in P is not completely trivial in this case. What you do to couple along P is essentially to compute uh, a problem with two P particles, right? And then compute out of this the quantity of interest, say, phi. And then if you, if you want to couple this with the uh, le levels that uh, contain less particles, actually, you make a split between the particles in this system into two systems, one each of them with P size. And out of them, you compute, say, the quantity of interest, say, phi 1, the, qu the quantity of interest, phi 2. And then you average these two. 
right? And then this is the control value that you use for that, okay? So this, this coupling actually is the one that uh, produces that complexity. If you use, for example, a coupling that connects these two P particles with just one of them, you don't get this result, okay? Uh, all right, so that's essentially what I wanted to tell you. Now again, you can do the, the computational uh, example where you, you check again that uh, the work it is, the, the work is, is, is going to be compared, but, but the error is, is meeting the tolerance in both cases. And uh, you see again that the constant is more or less the same, uh, but uh, things actually align with the theory if you have sufficiently many particles. Uh, and uh, the, the multi-level, say the best multi-level goes like 12 to the minus three, and the multi-level, uh, multi-index Monte Carlo goes like 12 to the minus two times log 12 square, essentially which is this. Remember, still, the Monte Carlo, in this case, gives you a complexity total to the minus four, okay? Which is not plotted in this, in this, uh, yeah, in this depiction. Okay, so uh, this is where I stop now. And uh, let's see. Any questions so far? I'm going to move a little bit. Yes? Yes, please. Uh, yes, uh, on the first uh, on the first slides. Um, yes, I move to the first slides. So in the multi-index uh, MIMC multi-index Monte Carlo, in fact, at the end there's still a bias. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Perhaps you can, uh, before, before, before. Uh, well, this, this was a bias, right? Yeah, this is the bias. Mm -hmm. Also, some Glee, uh, Glee and Rin, uh, Henry uh, mm -hmm. have introduced yes. another method um, where yes. they, they randomize uh, in mm -hmm. a way the, the level. So, mm -hmm. is there a randomized uh, version of this uh, MIMC? Uh, uh, I think there's a preprint out by uh, um, Cody Law and somebody else, yes? I still have not seen, uh, you know, how this behaves in terms of uh, complexity. Um, with respect to Glean and company, I think uh, there are some restrictions in the use of of, of the unbiased, right? Because if you if you have uh, say small variances, you can see that uh, the, you know the cost of it blows up, while the usual multi-index multi-level Monte Carlo will not have an explosion. So. As I told you yesterday, right? Yesterday I gave you an example where we started with an unbiased method, right? We produced a biased method that had less complexity. So uh, automatically the, the, the construction of an unbiased method does not guarantee that you're going to have a better complexity. Actually, sometimes you have it worse. So uh, at least for, for the cases I saw, uh, this is essentially the... the, the the unbiased method works well, essentially, when the, the, the biased method is in the 12 to the minus 2 regime, yep. which essentially works as if there would be no bias. Okay? So, yet I have not seen any convincing uh, argument to, you know, let me switch to an unbiased version, but maybe there is. Yeah, so, so essentially, and which means that you're in the 12 to the minus 2 for the other guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other comments? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So let's see what we can do. Um, so what did we do so far? We. Started with Monte Carlo, then we described multilayer Monte Carlo. We said that uh, if you have the right regularity assumptions, you can produce a multi-index Monte Carlo version that will bring more problems into the nice complexity case, which is told to the minus two, right? And we saw an example of stochastic particle systems, which is not sort of the obvious set of discretization parameters that you would think, right? So what was the purpose of that example? Is to make you think that there may be problems outside there, 
where you, in a non-standard way, you can find parameters of discretization that have the right mixed regularity, apply multi-index Monte Carlo, for instance, and get a much better complexity, right? So these, these parameters may, be, may not be the obvious sort of delta T, delta X. You may have to scratch your head and think a little bit about it, but if you find them, you will surely get uh, better complexity, okay? Now, uh, Okay, and then, then we said that it was also important to, to, uh, to in these multi-index constructions, to find the optimal sets for approximation, and these optimal sets relate to the thresholding of the profits, right? So you have to define the profits in your, in your problem, see if you have an a priori theory related to them, or just try to do something computational, threshold them, and this, this will give essentially the, the set for approximation. Okay, so that's more or less a recap. Now, what do we observe in this, in this type of um, estimate? Well, we observe that no matter what, we have a lower bound in the complexity that is told to be minus two. Okay, why? Because we use it Monte Carlo. There's no way around it. Okay, so if you have uh, some um, a priori knowledge saying that you may have regularity that you're not using, you're not using in your problem, for instance, that that uh, your, your, your uh, function that you're integrating in this, in this stochastic space is very smooth somehow, right? And whatever that means, this, this will come, come up later. But then you may think that, okay, instead of just using Monte Carlo, you may want to use a quadrature for the expected value computation that exploits some kind of higher uh, regularity. This may be quasi Monte Carlo, or it may be a, a a sparse grid type of uh, approximation. What we are, we are go going to discuss today is a sparse grid approach, okay? So, that, that having been said, okay, let's go to um, the point. So we're, okay, so why don't we actually take the, the break now before I go into the new topic? Okay. okay, so okay. should we should we say like five minutes, because I'm going to start with with this uh, this other this other thing, and I think okay. it's a good point to to stop and take the break. Okay. Okay. Thank then you. then I think it's instead of having to stop in between. Okay. Okay, we are going to continue now, and uh, the next the next topic is uh, multi-index stochastic collocation. And as I told you, the motivation here is to try to exploit available regularity in the, in the problem so that we can break a little bit this, uh, this barrier of tall 2 minus 2 coming out from the use of Monte Carlo. Okay? So that's, that's essentially what is at stake. Now, uh, so this may look a little bit heavy, but, but uh, it's not as much as you may think. So, what, what, is, uh, what is the idea behind, uh, behind multi-index um, multi stochastic collocation? So before, remember, okay, so let's see. Remember, the whole thing started being motivated by the expected value of G being approximated as uh, a sum over this set I calligraph, right, um, of what? Expected values of differences of G alpha, uh, G alphas, right? And if you use Monte Carlo to sample this thing, right, so if you approximate with Monte Carlo, you just go into multi-index Monte Carlo. Okay, but now you can think of, of this again being some integral over some uh, domain, say gamma, of uh, this random variable g alpha, and the input uh, coefficients in the PDE, for instance, are parameterized along. Uh, I mean, according to a vector y that may may be finite or even could be a sequence, but it has a certain density from y dy. Okay, and now when you have this, this in mind, you can think, okay, I could have used this, approximated this with Monte Carlo, 
but I could have used another technique. So, for instance, if you now approximate this with, uh, um, say, sparse grids, for instance, then essentially you go, you're going to go into what I'm going to describe now, which is Martinez stochastic location. Okay? So, you're going to sparsify not only with respect to these parameters that we call these spatial parameters in, in, uh, in um, you know, in the discretization, but also you will have some uh, sparse uh, in, in approximation here through the through the index that we will call it beta for the the quadrature of this of this integral. Okay. So now, uh, even though we will make somehow the distinction between these two directions, and we call it uh, alpha and beta, and they will now belong to a certain set. I calligraph that is not the same as before because this was just uh, just uh, in space, say, and now this this will be in space and the stochastic direction, right? Things are going to look pretty much the same. We're going to take deltas in all directions that will include directions just in space and then compose with directions uh, of, of differences in in uh, in the stochastic direction, and that those will be the ones that we will use for the thresholding and the definition of the of the profits and so forth, and from them we will get the the complexity results, okay? So let's look what we have here. Um, for the stochastic approximation, like I, like I told you before, uh, we will introduce some index, multi-index beta, that will essentially tell you how much you will, uh, how much you will use as order in the, in the, in the approximation of this, this integral. So, um, for that, essentially, what you do is to use an interpolatory quadrature. So um, instead of taking the expectation of, of a given function, right, you just take first an interpolant, and then you, you, you take the expected value of the interpolant, assuming, for example, that that can be done exactly. So um, the discretization parameter then is this beta, which is a level. Then there is a function that we call m of beta, which is a level to, uh, to points. So essentially, if you say, I'm, I'm going to use a, a quadrature uh, with order, uh, order one, or level one, then that uses one point. If you use uh, level two, maybe you're using three points. So depending on the, if it is Gaussian or, or trapezoidal or something, I mean, the, the function m beta may be different, okay? So, um, okay? So the deltas in this, in this way will be defined in the same way as before. You're just composing deltas in, in different directions now in this in this uh, space that contains the y vector, okay. And for the deterministic uh, discretization, we do exactly as before, so there's nothing nothing strange, okay. So, and that that again introduces a, a delta through the different discretization parameters as in the multi-index Monte Carlo, all right. So now um, these are the references that that uh, that we have. Uh, now what we have uh, are the, the, the different mixed, op uh, I mean, different uh, one-directional operators uh, in, uh, in the stochastic di direction and the, the deterministic direction. You compose them all, and sorry for the D here, but this is just a notation for the sort of deterministic directions and these are for the stochastic directions. They really mean nothing. I mean, it's just you can compose them and have the, the, the mixed difference acting in all directions. That's what you do, right? You, you take this g of alpha and beta now, as I told you before. Uh, you take the difference along the, the, the deterministic parameters for discretization, and then along the stochastic parameters. And that's essentially what you're doing here. Observe now that you know, since you are doing this, this, uh, this expectation by, by sparse quadrature, there is no variance anymore. This is just a deterministic computation, right? So um, yeah. There will be no distinction between bias and variance. I mean, vari bias and statistical errors before. It's just bias, right? So, but now we are working, instead of having a, a, a set of indices, multi-indices in, into the D as before, we have also this N capital that comes from the number of parameters uh, that you have in the stochastic representation, OK? Is that clear? That's important. Otherwise, if you get lost at this level, there's nothing that helps afterwards. Any questions? I didn't quite understand the stochastic OK, good. So that's, that's a good question. Hmm? Louder. It's different. From? 
adaptive parameters is different. No, 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 idea. these are not adaptive parameters. Mm. Okay, so, so let's, um, mm, I think I have an example here. Yeah, I do. Remember this example? Right? So, for example, taking take into account uh, the, the case, for example, where a of x is a of x and y say is just uh, the exp exponential of say a sum from say n equals one to n capital of sum say b n of x times y n. Okay, and and then essentially these are inputs that are later going to be composed with random variables. So essentially, you're going to take essentially y n later as uh, some y n of omega random variable. Okay, so this means that as inputs, you have n capital random variables, and if you give me the position in space and the values of those random variables, I give you the field, and through the field, I give you the solution u. So when you're going to integrate, take an expectation, essentially you're going to take the density, the joint density of, of this vector, right? Y, that compo is composed of y1, y2, and so forth, up to yn capital, and that's the integral that I'm referring to, okay? Is that clear now? So that's the input. Okay, good. Any other question? That's important. No? Okay. So the, that's how it looks, right? And then if you, if you actually want to, to do best approximation, uh, you need to define this i calligraph again. Observe that this i calligraph is not the same as we have with multi-index, right? Because it involves both indices now. You write a knapsack uh, formulation again. You solve it via this thresholding of profits. Um, the profits again come through the, the equation between the error and the work. Okay, these are the optimal, the, the quasi-optimal sets. Uh, this works not only for, for finite dimensions, but uh, also when, when this potentially can be infinite, right? So it, uh, it works naturally, it extends naturally to the infinite dimensional case. And, um, okay, so let's see. This is a, a case of, uh, of uh, this is an example. So let's take this equation now with the smooth coefficients and uh, you're, you're working with finite dimensions. So essentially this n is finite. And uh, because of the structure of the linear elliptic, uh, elliptic equation, you have analytic uh, dependence from the input, which is this, into the output, all right? So, you expect, in terms of the number of points that you use in the quadrature, to have this decay in the error. Okay, so you see algebraic conversions with respect to the, the H's, that's a finite element type of error, and exponential conversions with respect to the number of points in the quadrature. This is, a, this is coming out of the analytic uh, uh, dependence. Whereas in the work, essentially the, the, the work is as before, for the linear solves, you have this algebraic growth. But with respect to the quadratures and the points, well, it's just the number of quadratures, right? So the, the number of quadrature points. So if, if you were taking uh, the, the number of points growing like two to the beta, essentially, you get a product of two to the beta here. That's essentially what it happens, okay? Okay, so this, is, this doesn't look symmetric, right? I mean, you have a certain behavior with respect to the spatial coordinates and another behavior with respect to the, the, um, the stochastic ones. So, um, okay, so you have this assumption on the product rates that you have to show in, in, in your particular problem. So I told you that this was fulfilled for, for this, this example that I just discussed with exactly the, the discussion that uh, I made before. But um, let's take one step backward and look at what this implies in terms of optimal index sets. Before, uh, when we're doing multi-index uh, Monte Carlo, essentially, the optimal set contained only this part. So it was a hyperplane, remember, in terms of the indices alpha. Now, because of the addition of this, this uh, analytic dependence with respect to the stochastic direction, in the joint indices alpha and beta, this is no longer thresholded by a hyperplane, right? It has this, this extra, extra type of uh, behavior. And things tend of tend to, to, to curve right in the, in, the, in the corresponding direction. So as you grow, right, the, the sets, they're not growing, uh, you know, with, with hyperplanes as before. They are slightly different, okay? Just some, so this is exactly the same problem as before, but now the approximation sets have changed because instead of using Monte Carlo, you use a, 
as parse quadrature, all right? So if you use something different, for example, if you use uh, Quasi Monte Carlo, this will change. It will not be this or the other, it will be different. Is that clear? Okay. Um, okay, so from here you can show a, a, a complexity uh, result um, that is valid only in finite dimensions. We are going to see the infinite dimension just after that. So, but the interesting thing is, is essentially, forget about the log terms for the moment. Um, the interesting thing is what is this rate uh, Z here? And this Z actually is determined by the worst spatial discretization direction. So essentially, instead of getting total to the minus two, um, so instead of getting W to the, to the minus two, uh, that will be the worst, the, the, the best possible case for multi index Monte Carlo, you get something that now is not dominated by the quadrature, is dominated by the spatial discretization. Because the quadrature behaves in a nice way, right? It's exponentially convergent. So it's hidden, essentially, it's overshadowed by the, by the slower convergence that you have in space. So as long as it is algebraic, it will dominate the other part, which is converging exponentially, okay? So, okay, so this is just uh, the complexity of, I mean, this thing is essentially the complexity of a 1D deterministic problem, the worst direction, essentially. And the, the complexity of the stochastic location is not seen precisely. Um, now, you would say, okay, this is a little bit misleading because I had some, some space uh, of random variables that essentially could be dimension and capital, but I'm not seeing this, this, uh, this uh, index exponent, uh, right? So what, how could this be, right? Uh, the, there has to be some dependence in the, in the, in the number of uh, random variables that you have in the input. Well, the answer is that this result is finite dimensional because this constant actually uh, blows up with respect to the, to the end capital, okay? So it work, this is it's okay for a capital fixed, but if you, if you have an expansion here that doesn't have a finite end, these results should not be used, okay? Uh, but there is an idea, it tells you an idea what you can expect later when you go to infinite dimensions. Okay, so how does it work when you go and, and compute? So let's take a numerical example. This is essentially the same thing as we had before. Um, so this is 3D. Let's see, do I have some description here? Um, I think this is a 3D with some nice decay in the, in the eigenvalues. We compare multi-index stochastic location with other, with other methods, including the, the multi-index Monte Carlo. So the multi-index Monte Carlo, as I described you before, it's in the optimal rate. I mean, it's, it's getting the optimal rate. So it's, it's the, the work is growing like uh, W to the, the minus two, or um, W to the two, sorry. No, sorry, total to the minus two. Yes, two to the minus two. And the convergence of the error in terms of the work for Maltin this Monte Carlo is uh, essentially one over uh, square root of uh, the work, right? It's one half, right? It's optimal, okay? But, but that, that is what it is. So this Maltin this Monte Carlo works like this. This is the optimal behavior, it's great. But compared to these other methods, it really looks not fantastic, okay? So, uh, there are a bunch, of uh, a bunch of comparisons here, but you have just to, to keep in mind that this is essentially the multi-index stochastic location, right? That is really, really uh, getting a much better behavior out of the, the convergence. This is in dimension 10, essentially. And dimension three in the, in the, in the, in the deterministic uh, variable. So it's essentially the same problem as we saw before with multi-index Monte Carlo. It looked great there, but now it doesn't look that great anymore. Um, Okay, so what happens if you go to infinite dimensions? So when this thing is infinite, okay. do we still keep some nice behavior or the whole thing disappears? So let's try to, um, to look into this problem now. Um, usually when you, when you go and, and say, okay, I solved the problem of, of, with a random partial differential equation, they say, okay, what was the dimension you, you were working with, right? Does the problem really make sense? It may, I, I, I will try to make a case that it really doesn't make sense. Because I can actually put a zero in front of, say, 499 uh, you know, variables, and then they don't act, right? And uh, essentially, I solve a problem in 1D, but I'm claiming that I did it in 500 dimensions. So what really, really makes, uh, makes the point here is the class of regularity of the problem. 
Because essentially, in all cases, you will be solving a problem in infinite dimensions. But what is really, really important is what is the, the, the class of regularity in that infinite dimensional problem. If it is very, very smooth, say, then this, this, uh, this series here will be quickly decaying, and it will look like almost finite dimension, right? If, as you, as you have less and less regularity in the input field, this will become, you know, slower and slower convergent, and then you will feel much more out of it. So what really, really matters, that's the case I try to make, is, is the class of regularity. So if you, if you see this, then you say, okay, if I want to analyze a method, then I have to try to somehow parameterize the input regularity of the class of functions that are input to that problem, and then as a function of the regularity class, get the convergence rate, and see how the method behaves. I mean, for, for smooth problems, you will get this, and as you start deteriorating, deteriorating the regularity in the class, you get such that thing, okay? So it's not just one computation, it's just you try to, to follow the curve in terms of this, uh, this regularity class. Does it make sense? Okay, so how do we parameterize uh, the class again? Like I said, you will, you will see, you will play a little bit, this Ys will be fixed, you will play with these Bs here, and depending on the summability, essentially how fast this, this series is converging, you will get the corresponding rates for the convergence. Okay? All right. So um, now that we say that, essentially A is essentially the same kind of thing as before, but, but uh, you're working in D dimensions, so if you think of a Fourier expansion, now you will have many terms here with sinuses and cosinuses to, to represent the whole variability of the field, right? So you're still computing the same thing as before. This is an expected value of a quantity of interest. Uh, and uh, here is where it comes, essentially. The, the, you're making, okay, we change a little bit the notation. Instead of calling them, the, 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 uh, instead of calling them Bs and calling them size here for these sort of functions for doing the expansion. And we are making some uh, assumption on the summability of the series of these functions. So essentially, we say that if you take S derivatives on these functions, right, uh, and then you take an, in an infinity norm essentially on, this, on, this, uh, on these coefficients for the derivatives, then you raise it to the power PS and then try to see if this is finite or not. The smaller the P here, well, the better the behavior of this psi is, of course, right? Because, I mean, as, as uh, psi dec decreases faster and faster and faster, you can take a larger, a larger P, of course, right? So, um, and of course, uh, when you start taking more and more derivatives, these p's are going to deteriorate and become larger and larger and larger, right? Because it's more and more difficult to, to, uh, to sum these series. Just think of a series here that is done, uh, is done with sinuses here, sinus of nx times y, right? As you take derivatives, n powers come out, boom, 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 and the series starts converging slowly and slowly and slowly, right? Okay, so, um, Okay, so so then then uh, then actually you can you can go to uh, to estimates on the on the error based on this on this regularity, um, and you can show uh, some result of this kind, for example, that that essentially now the error is controlled in terms of the of the of the work. This is a little bit of weak notation now because this is an a. A, a misc with W. This means the work of, of the work of the of the method. Sorry for the convoluted notation, but this is essentially the work, right? To the power of minus R misc. So the convergence rate somehow up to a like delta here that is here just because you didn't follow we didn't want to follow all the log terms, right? So that's that's really why the delta is there. So you you should, don't worry about delta. Uh, so essentially, this is a convergence rate in terms of the work, like R misc, and that, and the, there are two cases essentially. Um, if the 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 summability is sufficiently nice, then uh, then essentially the the um, the rate is is uh, controlled by the by the deterministic direction, and if it is not, then you get an interpolation rate between the the summability of the of the stochastic coefficients and the and the, um, and the deterministic direction. Okay, so that's essentially what happens. So this is a number of, of s derivatives that you can take before this this uh, this um, 
this is a summability, right, for the for s and s being the maximum number of derivatives you can take before this this series uh, blows up in the in the input coefficient, and this is p zero, the, the the best summability coefficient essentially when it, that you have when you do not take any derivatives in the input. Okay. So uh, p zero is smaller than p uh, p s, and the, of course this is this difference is positive. All right. So. Uh, why do you have a, a sort of interpolatory result here? Well, um, essentially, there you have two, uh, two um, you have a compromise between two, two things. Essentially, to get the best rate in space, you need to, to get essentially um, a lot of regularity out of your coefficients. Think of, of, a, of getting, say, the best rate for multilinear finite elements. You need, say, an H2 function. And this requires that A, for example, is almost C1, okay? So you need to take derivatives on this to get, to get that control. If you want to take the best rate in, in the integration direction, I mean, the, in, the, in the expected value, you essentially want to have the best summability coefficients in this expansion. But that means taking no derivatives in that, in that direction. So on the one hand, to get the best rate in space, you need derivatives. In the other, if you want the best, the best, uh, the best um, behavior for the convergence rate of the integral, you need no derivative. You, I mean, you, you, you try to have as, as few derivatives as possible. Because of this fact, you get this, uh, this, uh, this interpolatory type of uh, rate. OK. Um, so now, now, like I told you, like I told you before, you are working in in a, in, a, in d dimensions in space, and uh, you have a series now that is done with respect to these y uh, input parameters that are going to be random variables, essentially. And this k, this kappa, is going to be the log of the of the of the diffusivity coefficient in the in the ex, you know in the PD in this linear PD. As you raise the, the regularity parameter nu, the series converges faster and faster and faster. You see it here, right? You need the, this d divided by 2 in the coefficients here just to ensure that, that uh, the, even without derivatives, the, the series makes sense. Um, OK, so um, and then in this case, you can actually figure out what is exact, um, I mean, what is the, the, optimal, the optimal rate that you expect in terms of regularity parameter and the dimension that, that you have in the space. Uh, OK, yeah. Uh, what else? So, uh, yes. So, so then you actually go and do, and do the, the computations. Um, so what do we show here? We show, first, a computation in 1D in space and still infinite dimensional. And then a computation in 3D and, again, infinite dimension. So what you see here with these stars is the convergence rate that you get computationally out of the, out of the discretization corresponding to the different smoothness in the input field. Okay? So as the input field gets, uh, gets smoother and smoother, essentially what you're getting here is a rate 2.0, which is a rate of a one-dimensional deterministic problem solve with a finite element that is piecewise linear. OK? So you started with a stochastic uh, problem that had infinite dimensional inputs. These are truly infinite dimensional inputs with the class that or regularity determined by nu. And as you start raising nu, you don't see that uh, the problem is stochastic, and you don't see that you're solving, uh, yeah, I mean, you're solving that. You just get the complexity of a deterministic finite element. If you do uh, the same with the 3D problem now, and you start raising the new, you get this. And at least for the computations that we made, uh, for the range of tolerance and that, that we made, this looks like saturating at uh, 1.4 instead of 2, right? I mean, if you think that you, you look at the, at the theory, essentially, then, then uh, up, apart from the log terms, you would expect a convergence rate it should be the same as in 1D. But in 1D, you get 2, and then here you get 1.4, essentially. OK? What happens? Well, actually, the log terms matters. That's, that's really what happens. The, let's, let's, uh, let's look at, uh, at that. OK, so this is, 
these are just two examples of how, how we actually get the, the stars in the plot that we saw before in 1D and in, in 3D. And this again shows a, a comparison between Malte Index Monte Carlo and, and uh, this Malte Index stochastical location. So you see that Malte Index Monte Carlo is still working with TOT2 minus 2 is optimal, but compared with this, it really looks poor. Okay, so before we go into that, let's discuss the log term. So what, does that, what is it that we show here? We show now a deterministic computation in 1D, right? And the, and the, the, um, the convergence rate that we get in, uh, in, in, uh, in both cases. So let me see, this is 1.96, I think, and this is uh, 1.4, essentially the one we got in the plot that I, I was showing you. And this is w to the minus 2 times log w squared, which is the, the real thing that, that should be happening, right? The, the, the log term that we hid in the delta, in the delta exponent. So if you actually see the, the, the behavior of this 1.4 curve and, the, and the, the, the correction with the log term, you get essentially in this range of, of, uh, of computations, a fit with 1.4 if you just do it uh, algebraically, okay? So what, what happened there is that we were not observing the, the convergence rate two just because the log term in that, re in that regime is active, okay? But yeah, we expect that if you continue uh, working deeper and deeper in the tolerances, you will still get uh, the convergence rate that is a square, which is uh, the 1D finite element the diminutive computation. Uh, okay, so what about the dimension? So what, uh, how does the dimension behave with respect to the, the tolerance, or if you wish, the, the amount of work that you invest? And what do we define by dimension? So if you think again into this, into this type of uh, computation, right? Um, when, we, when we make these, these things, we are linearly combining terms that activate a given alpha and a given beta. When people would say, okay, what was the dimension that, that you used somehow, they will look over this sum, right, over this set, and see, for example, what was the largest, uh, uh, for instance, the, the, the largest beta that you use in a certain direction, or you could think of um, how many non-zero indices any of these betas may have, okay? So how many, at any point, right, how many dimensions did you activate? Or they can also look at how many, of, uh, how many dimensions were simultaneously activated, meaning that if you just look at each of these terms that appear in that sum, you look at only the beta part and you see the support of it and count how many, how, how, what's the length of the support, essentially how many non-zeros you have in this beta. And then take the maximum value of that over the whole, the whole thing and that is the number of simultaneously active, right? So this simultaneously active may be quite different from the total number of random variables that you touch at some point, right? That we may, and this is what we show here. So this is the computation in 1D, and this is the computation in 3D. The same thing as before, for a given value of, of nu, okay? And what you see here is the, the work is growing, right? And here is essentially how the number of um, dimensions that you activate is growing, okay? So um, I cannot see, uh, let's see. This is actually not so super clear. Let me see if I can see it better here. Problems with the eyesight, right? Let me see. It's a bad combination of PDF and my eyes. But uh, what I want to show essentially here is that the, the number of active random, random variables grows to essentially 10 to the 3 in, in, this, in this case. Whereas if you look at, at the number of simultaneously active, that is what I told you, each of these betas, um, you know, you look at each of the single betas and count how many non-zeros you have, this essentially stays on the order of 10, okay? And this, this, this number is the really important one not this one, because what you really have to look essentially is how much it costs to compute each of the terms in the sum, 
Okay? And for each of the terms in the sum, essentially, you only see at most 10, 10 random variables simultaneously. Whereas in the total sum, you activate on the order of thousands. Okay? And that's really what allows these deterministic methods to compete. If you don't have this, this behavior, as, as I show you, on the, on the right curve, on, on this right curve, you have no, no, no way to compete with multi layer Monte Carlo or Monte Carlo type of methods. Okay? That's essentially what I want to, to send as a message here. Okay. Uh, so these, these things that I discussed so far uh, are implemented in a, in a library that is called the Mayon Silive, and uh, Abdo is the main developer. Um, so these these are the main references in the in the in, in the development of that uh, library, but it also has multi index stochastic location and and uh, recently even the multi level uh, projection I mean regression type of uh, method. So uh, any questions at this moment? I'm going to switch a little bit now. Yes, please. Uh, I just do not get what do you mean by the Dimension. Yes, okay. So let's see if we can go through. Uh, I just do not get how, what do you mean exactly by uh, activating the dimension? So you explained mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. but yes, I didn't yes, get it. Yes, Thank yes. you. Okay. So uh, activated dimensions will be the following. You have a sum, right, of, this, of these indices, alpha and beta. Uh, and and if, I, if I have to raise the number of quadrature points in one direction at any time, at any time above one, which is a trivial one, I will count that dimension as active because at some point in the discretization, I have to go beyond the trivial discretization. Okay? So it's a physics for any member of the sum essentially to activate that dimension for that dimension to be counted as active. Okay? So you just look over all terms and if this thing was active at some term, you count it as active. The count of simultaneously active is different. You look at how many of those were simultaneously active in a single term. So you look at these betas, right? And for each of these betas, you look at the support, meaning which are the number of which is the number of non-trivial indices, right? So they could be, for example, three or four, right? So this is a number that grows very slowly, whereas the number that 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 has, for example, active dimensions, which is essentially how many of them are active in any possible term, grows much faster, right? And, and that's usually what people tell you, tell you the, the, the one that grows faster, right? And they say, okay, I did it in two thousand dimensions. But really what makes possible the computation is the other number that stays on the order 10 or so. That's the message. Is that clear? Thank you. Any other question? Okay, so um, so I was telling you um, this this library more or less is piling up the the, the different methods and uh, it is uh, done with an, uh, an interface in Python and but the core is in C and it allows you to to just uh, connect with the with your um, with your simulator, right, and call it with the different uh, level of approximation. And it has been tested in, uh, in stochastic differential equations, stochastic particle systems, random PDEs, and stochastic reaction networks of the pure jam processes that I described before, okay? So it, it is really flexible. I mean, you, you pass the, the, the problem and it can, handle, um, it can handle it quite well. If you have, again, the, the right regularity assumptions in the convergence, right? That's important <laughs> to remember. Okay, so you can actually, okay, this is going to be a little bit of advertising. The, the, um, some things that are ongoing now, the, the need to handle uh, more general um, geometries can be done, for example, with isogeometric analysis in this context because it allows you to tensorize uh, the representation of the geometries and then refine anisotropically. Uh, and that fits very nicely with the multi-index stochastic location. This is ongoing. Um, and this is just an example, a numerical test, again, of the same kind, um, with a few random variables. This is not infinite dimensional, as I told you before, but uh, again, you have a, a nice rate of convergence in, in space that you cannot exploit using multi-index Monte Carlo, 
uh, not with multi-level as well, uh, but when you combine this with multi-index stochastic collocation, you get a rate that uh, that uh, is reduced a little bit from the from the others. Okay, this is ongoing, so it's just just something that is ongoing. Um, okay, I don't have time to discuss this, but um, I told you at the beginning that uh, I would exemplify. Uh, the computations with multi-index and multi-level through this expected value of a given quantity of interest, right? But multi-index or multi-level methods can be used to compute other things. For instance, uh, the covariance, for example, uh, out of a, of a vector, a finite dimension of vector of quantities of interest. And why is that important, for instance? Uh, well, sometimes you may want to compute the covariance because you want to compute it and, and get some idea uh, out of it. But uh, what we did was to compute it with the purpose of using it inside a, a data simulation uh, uh, procedure. So what we came up with was this multi-level ensemble Kalman filtering that was done first for stochastic differential equations of finite dimensional uh, type. But now uh, we are resubmitting the, the multi-level version for, the, for uh, an infinite dimensional system, essentially for a PDE. Uh, that, again, is driven by, by by, by sort of ETO type of uh, noise. Uh, okay, so why it's important to, to compute uh, the covariance in a multi-level way there? Because essentially in the assimilation step, if you're familiar with, the, with the, the, the ensemble Kalman filter, you need to compute the covariance of the state. And you need to compute the covariance of the state out of um, a particle system, essentially. Uh, so, so you send many, many paths, right, of, uh, of the differential equation. And the whole thing, uh, if you just do it with the usual ensemble Kalman filter, will require cost that is, is done with, say, P of these paths, right? And all of them with the same type of discretization. And then you compute an, an ensemble covariance uh, uh, matrix. This ensemble covariance matrix can be written in a, in a multi-level way and, and then used for the assimilation step. And the assimilation step then uh, inherits the complexity of the of the usual multi-level, forward multi-level Monte Carlo. So, so the, pro, the promise that one is trying to, or the, the dream that one has in this, in this program with inverse problems essentially is to bring to the different type of inverse problems the complexity of multi-level or multi-index that one observes in the forward problems. Okay? So, uh, so this is a here for multi-level ensemble common filter. That's a, the state estimation filtering type of problem. Uh, for smoothing as well, and uh, recently for regression. Okay, so in uh, in regression, you uh, you need to approximate a function, right? But uh, in this context, the function that you want to approximate cannot be sampled exactly. I'm not just discussing a statistical error, but but say um, bias error. Why? Because maybe your 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 the function you want to approximate is a solution of a PE. Is it? I mean, as we discussed before. It, it is the functional out of the solution U. So the function that you want to approximate, say, is this functional applied to Q, and Q depends on Y. And this function, say, we call it, I don't know, F of, no, F is a bad, bad thing, so, because I use it F here, so. <sighs> theta, no, it's not a good thing. Uh, eta, eta of Y, say. This function is what I want to approximate, but I will never, uh, I will never get samples of this. I will get samples of, this. So the question is, can you actually uh, exploit the fact that you, you are getting a, a approximate samples with increasing cost as h goes to zero, but, but also increasing accuracy? And the answer is yes, you can actually do that. Actually, this is a work with Søren. Søren maybe is here, maybe not. <laughs> no, maybe Søren is not here. Um, but uh, yeah, so Søren Wolfers actually is, is here around. Um, it's one of my PhDs at, at Kaust. And um, this actually can be very effective. Um, so the first work in, the, in, the, in finite dimensions is just out. Let's see. Um, a little word on optimal design of experiments. So um, what is it about? Well, essentially, in inverse problems, we need to find a parameter, right? So what do we do? We, we, we gather data, and uh, 
in a Bayesian context or maximum likelihood context, we use the data to to um, to come with a, in, in one case with a posterior density on the on the parameter we want to infer, or say with a maximum likelihood type of of a single point estimation for the for the for the for the um, parameter. But essentially, the data is given. So somebody carry, carried out the experiment, right? You're given the data, and you do the the analysis to provide a posterior or or some estimate on the on the parameter. The game with the with the optimal experimental design is a little bit higher. So essentially, you want to say, no, don't do the experiment. Just tell me a model, more or less, of the experiments that you want to carry out. Try to describe the data, the connection with with the with, from the parameter to the data in a mathematical way. Describe to me also what kind of noise the device that you're going to use is going to be subject to. And then let's try to find out what is the best type of experiment that you can carry out, essentially. By best, you will say, what will be the one that provides you most information on the parameters you want to infer? So how do you, you actually um, formalize that? Well, you say, if I am in a Bayesian context, before running the experiments, I have some prior knowledge. I read the books, I talk to people that are experts in the, in the field, and they tell me that more or less my parameter is in this, re in this region, right? That's my prior. What I want to do is to carry out an experiment so that the posterior we concentrate somehow maximally with respect to the prior, okay? Right, so how do you, do you formalize that? Well, you say, I want to measure some difference between these two distributions, the, 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 the prior and the posterior, and maximize the difference. So the, the difference we, we use is the kullback leibler divergence between the two, the, two the, post, the prior and the posterior. But the kullback leibler um, divergence assumes that actually you, you carried out the, the, the data, and you, uh, you, you carried out the experiment, got the data, and got the posterior. But the data is going to be random, because essentially you don't know essentially what the parameter will be. So you somehow have to, to, um, to take, a, to take a, an expected, you know, an expected maximization approach, because essentially you're going to define a utility, which will be the, the, the divergence from the prior to the posterior. Depending on where the parameter is going to be, the posterior will be in different places, but this distance between posterior and prior is going to be measured. And essentially, you're going to take the average with respect to all possible experiments or all possible data that you, you, you can gather, right? Because the parameter can take different values. So that's why we actually take the expected information gain approach. The information gain is essentially the, the divergence, the kullback library divergence between the prior and the posterior. That's with respect to the, the possible values of the parameter around a variable, and you take the average of that, okay? So you maximize with respect to all possible outcomes somehow, all right? So that's what, what we do, um, and uh, we have applied this in different contexts. And uh, okay, so I'll tell you a little bit more about the problem. Um, the problem looks like this. You have a data model, and again, this is an example because we're assuming that the noise is additive. Um, but this is a model, right? You have essentially some, before carrying out the experiments, you say, okay, if, I'm, if my parameter, the one that I want to infer, has a, a given value, and I choose to set the experiment uh, parameters, say, to take this value, then the type of data that I'm going to get is this, okay? So this G usually involves the solution of a PDE. This theta could be related to this, this, uh, this coefficient that I'm trying to, to, to infer, right? And this G could be related with a vector of observables of this type, okay? So um, that's essentially what happens here, and then essentially, the, the expected information gain, it's a nested expectation. It's a double integral, essentially, that, that uh, connects the prior uh, and the posterior um, in this way. So, so what, what really complicates the, the, the life here is this evidence term that is essentially an integral on its own and brings you to a double loop Monte Carlo computation if you just do this naively, all right? And that's what, what makes the complexity of this, this computation really nasty. Um, so, in the computational approach, as I told you, we need to compute nested expectations, and uh, to do that, we address them with asymptotic approximations, important sampling techniques, and multi-level. So we combine multi-level with the uh, important sampling. And why is that so? I mean, why would you expect that a problem like this will require important sampling? Well, essentially, 
you can always sample from priors, right? But but if if the the setup, the experimental setup is going to be worth, um, then you will expect that as the number of the experiments, repetitive experiments grow, the posterior on the on the parameter you want to infer is concentrating around the point. Okay, so the prior looks like something flat, and the posterior is concentrating. When you go and do these computations with multi-level, or, or with just Monte Carlo, you realize that sampling from the prior in such an event where the, 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 the posterior density is becoming increasingly singular with respect to the prior is, is a bad idea. You will lose most of the, of the computations that you do. Okay? So it's very important to change the measure to try to follow this peak. And that's what, 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 why the measure, measure changes are so relevant in this context. Uh, so, um, yes. Yes. So, so you're assuming, uh, you are assuming that you know well the, this uh, distribution of the filter somehow. Or... Not well. I mean, <laughs> not really well. I mean, the only thing that you assume is a prior uh, knowledge on the theta, which is a prior distribution that comes from the experts in the field. It, it could be flat. Say, for example, this conductivity value could be between, say, 0.1 and 10. And what do you know about it? Nothing. So I take maybe a flat prior in that interval. Or they know something more. They say, okay, it's more likely to concentrate in the, in the middle, right? And then you take something that represents that. But that thing is coming out from the experts or the books or, you know, looking in Wikipedia or something like that. That's what you assume. And that's the beginning of everything. Okay? What if you don't really have that much uh, certainty on that uh, part? Well, then you take a, a, a wider prior, right? That's, that's essentially what happens. I mean, there is no solution for that. The, the, the flat Laplace the, the distribution is the, the one with maximum entropy, essentially. So you have to do that. I mean, so uh, you, need, you need, I mean, physically, for example, you know that conductivity cannot go below CEO. And uh, if you're working with metals, you know a certain thing. If you're working with polymers, you know another thing. So. This is not by this is by no means a totally black box. You need some input, okay? And based on that input, then you start concentrating. All right? Doesn't make sense. Okay. Okay. So, any other question at this point? Okay. Um, so, for instance, you have uh, electrical impedance tomography. This is in composite material. So, essentially, what do you want to to know here, you have some, some volume here, and you want to more or less infer what is going on inside. So what you're going to do is to attach electrodes in different positions. And through some of them, you're going to in inject currents. And the currents will be, say, your control, uh, uh, your control variables. And at those points, or some of them, you're going to measure voltages. Okay, and voltages will be the data, all right? So what to do here? Well, we want to discuss how much current we want to, 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 to inject, and we want to know where to put these electrodes. These are normal sort of experimental type of uh, parameters you can play with. What do you want to learn? Well, say that you are in, a, in this composite type of a layer, layer material with plies, and uh, these plies have fibers, and you want to more or less put the fi uh, you want to learn in w what is the angle with respect to, say, a given direction that these this, uh, this, um, fibers inside of the plies have. Okay? So if you have, say, two, two layers here, there will be one angle and another angle uh, corresponding to each of the, the plies. All right? So that's one thing. Uh, Okay, so this is more or less the, 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 the setup with the parameters. You have some noise at the electrodes. And again, you want to play, in this case, with just the position of the, of the electrodes and the, their size to maximize the, the, the knowledge on the, on the place orientation angles. Um, okay, so this will be the cartoon of, of the thing. So first ply, second ply, you have some boundary conditions, position of electrodes. This is isolated here, it's isolated there, right? So what goes in at some point has to go out through the others. This is a uh, uh, Kirchhoff. Um, so, um, 
Okay, so this is a this is for example a computation with a with a particular choice of of the geometry and the, the, how the current is going from the top to the bottom, essentially in the different places. You see that nothing goes out here. Uh, and you see that the, if you look at the expected information gain, there's a maximal, uh, maximal choice of, of uh, I mean, maximum concentration with respect to the choice of the geometry uh, that improves from this type of a, of a little bit fat, uh, fat PDFs into, into a thinner concentrated one. Now, um, I'll give you just the last example to, to, to close here. This is something, again, to give you intuition, because, I mean, sometimes you may say, okay, how much can I expect? Maybe there's not much. Yes, please. Sorry, sorry, just a quick question. Do you keep the, 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 the power? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you keep the power that you are, do you, do you have constraints on the power that you are no, using? No, in this one, in this one, we're just moving the geometry of the, of the electrode. So essentially, the same, the same, uh, electricity was coming, the, the same uh, current was coming from each of the electrodes. So it was an integral constraint over the, over the electrode, yeah. and the total, the total injected uh, current is, is constant. Uh -huh. okay. okay. no, I, I would try to, to limit the power because uh, I don't know, I, I mean, perhaps in this case, limiting the, well, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in this the, case. The, um, yeah, well, limiting the power the, yeah. is bounded in the sense that the, the, the of R. yes, so it is it is constrained yeah. automatically from there. So we don't we are not varying the the number of electrodes and the number of I mean and the electricity coming from each of them is is a given value. So in that respect, is I think bounded. Thank you. Um, okay, so then th this last example. Um, so, so what happens here? Essentially, this is a simplified version of the previous one. The only thing that we do, instead of playing with the geometry, we play with the, the, the current that we're injecting um, or extracting, say, here in the bottom. So here you see, you, you inject plus one, you take out minus one, and here you're going to inject or take out, depending on the sign of psi one, some current, and the same thing has to go out here, otherwise we don't get the stationary problem, right? So. Uh, and then we have some prior uh, knowledge on the orientation of these angles. They, they, know, they, they can be within this value and this value and within this value and this value for the other ply. And we can just play with constraints here. Uh, psi can go only from minus one to one. So that controls the power, right? So that, that is a constraint on the power. So what happens here when you go and optimize you see, for example, from a very non-optimal case, which is essentially to, inject, uh, to take out 0.3 here and uh, inject here 0.3, you go to an optimal case, which essentially injects plus one, which is the same here as, as the one that we were using here, and takes out minus one. And why is that, I mean, intuitively, why is that going to give you an advantage? Well, maybe with the voltage, it's not so clear to see it, because these are the voltage uh, lines, but when, once you see the flux, I mean, the flux of the current. This is, uh, this is more evident. When you, when you take out current here in the bottom, like that, you essentially push, push the current lines to go only, almost, through the second ply. And you learn little about the first one. And this can be worse and worse if this gets longer and longer. Whereas in the second case, you, you, you're navigating um, the, the, the body in a more kind of uniform way. Uh, and this, you can see it. Uh, this you, you can see it in the, in the, in the corresponding example uh, posterior. So this is essentially a flat prior, like we said before. We didn't know much of the angles, so we take a constant uh, prior over a, over a given square here. If you choose the non-optimal disposition of the currents, essentially the, the, from the prior to the posterior, you don't concentrate along the first, almost the, you don't concentrate along the first, uh, the first, um, uh, ply, at least in comparison with the, with the second direction, right? You, you still go through all the values. Whereas with respect to the first, the, the other dimension, you concentrate much. Now, if you, if you look at the optimal disposition of the current, you get this blue posterior, which is much more concentrated than the, than the non-optimal one. So it's, I mean, you can zoom into it and it's, it's really a, a, a big difference between the optimized, optimized and non-optimized uh, version. And uh, I come to my conclusions, say, I think I 
just got the time. This is another picture from Kaust. Uh, this is uh, our library, essentially. So this is a view from our library. And this is a Red Sea, actually. So you see that that's a nice place. Um, OK, so multi-level, multi indices uh, methods can be uh, substantially reduce the cost of uh, stochastic computations in UQ. Um, we have illustrated the examples, uh, I mean, the computation again through a variety of examples. I hope this will uh, help you get motivated to do this stuff. And uh, as, at, at the end, I briefly touched upon the fact that uh, you not only can compute uh, forward type of uh, computations, right, predictions, but you can also use these methods in the context of inverse, uh, inverse problems and data science. All right, and that's it, merci. Uh, can we go back to the, uh, what you showed on Mackin-Vazoff equations, so in the first part of this lecture today? Uh, assume now that the, the interaction is local. Mm -hmm. Uh, so from the numerical point of view, you would have a, a small kernel mm -hmm. with some, uh, some... Yeah, visibility, for example. Pedestrians that uh, can only exactly. see 10 meters away. So could you play with the uh, discretization of, with the size of the kernel in your, in your methods to, 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 to let it vary? In, uh, in principle, yes. But, but I think it will make much more sense if, if uh, the kernels are a little bit uh, not so local. Because if they're not so local, they imply, unless you do tricks like uh, multipolar, things like that, more cost because you have to count more particles. So uh, if you start localizing the interaction somehow, um, then you have less work. And at the same time, you introduce a bias. So that's the type of approximation, right? You, you want to, always when you think of a parameter, you want to have a parameter that introduces error, but saves you work, okay? So I tell you, one thing is to, to play with the shape of the kernel, like I said, and the other is to say, okay, what, what do I have here? I have a sum, okay? And the sum here is, in, is, is, is affected by the kernel. The kernel is affected by the distance, the kernel is doing like this. So either you modify the kernel, or you, you, you can say the following, you can say, okay, what do I do when I have large sums that I do not want to sum? I use samples, right? So, so you can actually wait. I mean, you introduce a, a weight here, and you, you try to do some kind of sampling of this, of this p. So even though you have p particles in the system, when you do the interaction, you randomly pick uh, fewer, right? And uh, this is an equivalent way to more or less do what you're saying, OK? But it's not going to give you much if the interaction was too local, because if it was too local, there were few particles anyway. So it depends on, this is, the answer is relative, right? I mean, it depends on how many particles you really think you are going to activate in this interaction. And this will be more or less a gain that you could get. If there are only a few because the thing was already too local, there's not much to gain, but does it make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so. Uh, now I'm seeing the Makin uh, SDs. I have a question. So, what are typically the assumptions on the uh, law mm -hmm. that we have to assume to be able to deal with this kind of problems? Actually? Okay, so that's a good question. The the main assumption that uh, that brings you uh, everywhere is the convergence rates on the on the differences. So let's see. What do you want to check essentially is Ah, come on. <clears throat> you need to be able to verify these assumptions, right? On the convergence rates for the um, for the um, differences. So you need to, yeah. to, to check the convergence 
in the in the in the expected value sense and in the variance. So what does it mean actually? The, you you need to compute uh, expected values at fi uh, at final time, having different uh, levels of approximation. So this is expressed in terms of the solution of of, of a Feynman you know a Feynman catch uh, equation. Essentially, you 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 write the Komogorov backward and you try to solve. To, first, you have to represent these these expectations and variance in, ter in terms of that solution. Mm -hmm. So it really comes. Um, to the to the solution of that equation, I cannot write it in terms of the density. I mean, do you understand what I mean? The the the, the conditions somehow, at least what we're working with, are are, uh, are to check the properties of the Col of the Kolmogorov backward equation. Okay. Okay. What becomes tricky is that that uh, this essentially is a is a, is a checkup of consistency between the the finite dimensional system and the infinite dimensional system. And uh, whenever you take these differences, you, you, you need to represent the difference and, and, and check and use certain paths, whether you are going to use the paths of the finite dimensional system or the infinite dimensional system. What we're working with is the paths of the infinite dimensional system because they have this nice independence property, right? Okay. okay. But, but it's, it's, it's tricky and it's checked in that level. Yeah. It's not checked in the level of the of the density, at least the way we are thinking. It could be other proofs. So yeah. Thank you. Know. Okay. So I have uh, two small questions. So yes. the first about the uh, about this uh, Bakin Vlasov stuff. So you're approximating mm -hmm. expected value of the function. Yes. But have you thought or tried numerically to approximate, if you, for example, are interested to approximate a distribution or a density, so you have a functional that depends on the space, mm -hmm. how would you do that? Would you do it, run the simulation? I, I just want to, to check, essentially. The, the, we, we say we want to compute something like this, right? So one way is to compute the expected value of these, and, and what you say is maybe compute, say, a CDF of these, or what? So you, you want to, let's say, approximate a distribution function that at different points in space of your process. Okay, but this means essentially, this means if I, again, if I understand correctly, is like you will take GIs here, and you, out of these GIs, you will compute the CDFs, and then maybe finitely many I points. Is that what you mean? Um, I, well, I'm, I'm question is what would you do so uh, yes you, but you first say, I want to understand what is to, to be computed no, approx you want to approximate the distribution function so you have an underlying yes. PDE you're trying to approximate the PDE not in one point but in the in the, in the whole space so you have a, a, a functional rather than just function depending on the particles but maybe you could you know you're saying no, that no. you have a particles and you will just from these particles you'll be the estimator is that what so so again given a, a, a particular time and a particular position, and then you do this in many places, or you want the whole function, because for the whole function, I cannot compute the PDF, right? I mean, it, it's a function, so, so... You need to approximate it, yeah. No. I mean, maybe I'm misunderstanding. The at final time, let's say. For example, at final time. Final time, compute what? Because at, at final time, I have if infinitely many positions and infinitely many velocities, say. So, so this is an object that is already infinite dimensional. So, if I want to compute the distribution of this, what do I do? You mean the density first? Maybe you mean something different. So the marginal density. Yes, at time. Okay, the marginal. Okay, the marginal density. Okay, the, now, now this is different. Okay, the marginal density. Then, if you if you want to compute marginal densities, you one one of the things that uh, that is around is what Mike, for example, did with the with Ritter to compute CDFs out of, out of Maltese and Monte Carlo. Okay. That's one way to do this with, with multi-level type of uh, computations, if that is what you, what you imply. Uh, but uh, this yeah, is, yeah, this is his work, you've, yes. You've tried this, so, you've tested this. Uh, no, 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 I have okay. not tried that. No, 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 no. Uh, but if I would have to do it, uh, I, I would try to use uh, Mike's, uh, okay. Mike's uh, so this implies computing at different values, right? Taking an interpolation, so okay. it can be done, but it will be more complex, definitely. Okay. Uh, but so I understand now. I mean, you wanted okay. the marginal. I, I, well, yes. I was. The. the that there is a better estimation. You must have, uh, say, you must obtain better estimation of densities with multi-level. 
No, the, the rate is, yeah, yeah, you can improve with multilevel, but the rate is usually worse, right? Because you have to compute more things, right? To compute the CDF is more complicated than an expected value. Yes. And the, the second question is, you say that the, when you had a slide with the rates, so you have these big slides, different, different ideas and different complexities. Uh, yes, this one here. So you say that uh, without this um, trick, uh, you, don't, you don't gain. So have you tested? How ex extensively you've tested the case that you, with the, this partitioning, you observe, well, 1 over n square? Uh, well, we did it with uh, a few systems, but I mean, I cannot say that we do, with this, that is done for all, I mean. No, 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 so I'm just. We, we, we have interactions that were not local, essentially, like these sinuses, for example. Mm -hmm. So. Um, have you tr tried to, um, I don't know, multi-dimensional uh, systems or more we tried with, we tried or less with the, symmetric functions? We tried with the, um, the pedestrian flow in 2D, mm -hmm. uh, but we have not done swarms in 3D or things like that. So, it, so it seems to work. That, seems to that work. I think should be maybe tried. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, there was no dependence on the dimension, but I cannot say what will happen with the with local kernels, right? I mean, because I mean, these things work nicely if you are close to the mean field. If you, mm -hmm. if you have local interactions, this may take lo larger sizes, right, in particles to, to observe the rates. Okay. The, this example was particularly good because the, everything was asymptotical already from the beginning. In, in look, look, at the, look at the variance and expectation, right? It looks like a fake, almost like a straight line. Yeah. That is real computation. So mm -hmm. um, other problems may not be as, as simple as this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think I'm we're going to stop the questions here and perhaps uh, mm -hmm. postpone the discussion Thank to you. the break. Thank you again, Aurel, for this Thank nice you. talk.